Okay, shall we, shall we make a start? Uh, this is advertised as a, as a conversation, um, which means that I hope Dave and I will have a conversation, but it's also one that you can take part in, uh, in the spirit of a conversation. That is, we can ask perhaps more, more, can you hear Donald? Is this meeting you can't hear? Is this my fault or the microphone's fault? Shall we try like this? Is that okay? So we is this one working too? Yeah. So it it needn't um, just be me. Uh, it could be others of us too. But it's a chance just to talk to David in a rather different way than we might talk if we had a sort of seminar about the issues. Um, now, David, uh, along the way this afternoon, talked about how he got his job at Sussex. Uh, and that reminded me, listening to that, how I um, became at one of the two editors of the Political Quarterly. Uh, I'd, written, I'd written an article. My first article ever published was in the Political Quarterly. And interestingly enough, because of what's been said earlier on, it was called The Case Against John McIntosh. <laughs> <laughs> and it was all about the, the referendum in 1975 where mm. Macintosh thought this was a very bad idea and I wrote a piece of a kind that a young man writes oh, that say, referendum, yeah. saying um, it might be a jolly good idea uh, and might do some good, some good things um, I suppose that conversation still goes on anyway I, I uh, I'd done that, and also uh, I'd written a, a book on G.D.H. Cole, which Bernard, we haven't mentioned Bernard Crick yet today. We, we can't have an event like without mentioning Bernard, which he, Bernard reviewed in the, in the Guardian quite kindly. And then he approached me about whether I'd become an editor of the Political Quarterly. Um, in fact, I saw the, no the note he wrote me the other day when I was looking through stuff at home, and it's, it was a lovely note which said, Oh, I think you'd be a very good person, uh, and all that stuff. He said, we, we we're supposed to do these things democratically. He said, this was the great Democrat, but I think I can fix it. <laughs> <laughs> and, one of, I, I, and so he did. And one of the attractions of that was, of course, that, that um, David here was the existing editor. And so, although, as, to use the word that Will Hutton used earlier on, I'd been a disciple of David's for many years. Indeed, I think I probably have got 40 years to my credit in that respect. Um, it enabled me to see and work more closely with David than I'd ever done before, and that was a real pleasure. It wasn't uh, entirely a pleasure, <laughs> because you were maddened about my way of never <laughs> taking decisions on articles that came in. At, at, a, at a higher level, it was a real pleasure. <laughs> And I, I, you know, it's been, various things have been said already today, but um, I mean, for me, uh, sometimes you find, uh, you know, you find a voice, uh, if you're lucky early on in life, that you can trust uh, and you want to hear more of um, and uh, becomes one of your sort of load, load stars. And that was David. And I'm not alone in that. It's true probably of many people here. Um, and when people say that he is, I don't know, what do they say? He's one of our, or perhaps even the leading public intellectual of our day. That is a very considerable thing to be in an age where such people do not exist very much anymore. The idea of people who move effortlessly from writing leaders in The Guardian to producing books on issues of the day accessible to anybody with a a lively interest as a citizen, pulling in material from all different places, uh, is a very rare, a very rare commodity, and to be doing that for the last 40 years or so, uh, as an unerring guide to what's been going on, I think is really quite remarkable. But I'm not just going to sit here in a, in a spirit of hero worship, uh, because I want at least on one front to pick a bit of a fight with him. 
if I can. People have been very, very deferential. Yes, much too much. So, so far. Not nearly um, enough, actually. But I, want, <laughs> I, I, I want to press you a bit on the question that uh, Anthony Barnett asked you right at, at the end, this optimism-pessimism thing. And you gave a very sweet answer. Uh, and it's an answer that I recognize because it's one that, that many of us have employed over the years, which is that you produce some rather bleak analysis and then you offer a little sort of scintilla of hope at the end just to keep the spirits up. And I, um, I'd quite like to know really, to push you a bit more on that and to say, you know, you could read your, you could read your stuff in a very bleak way. I mean, you, I, that your latest book, you, you, t you talk about it being a wake-up call as we head towards a seedy barbarism. I mean, that's pretty depressing stuff, isn't it? Hmm. You think it's too depressing? Well, I want to know from you whether, ah, whether this reflects. Well, <laughs> I think um, I, th I feel more optimistic now than I did then. Um, I'm not sure why that is. Maybe it's self-deception. I think the analysis, I don't really need from the analysis in, in uh, Mammon. Um, I qualify it in certain respects and, you know, and so on. But on the fundamentals of the thing, I don't read from it. But I think at the end of the book, I make a strong call for what I call a revolution of sentiment, right? I've been attacked by some reviewers, notably John Gray, uh, for saying this. He thinks it's utter nonsense. How can there be a revolution of sentiment? Um, but I now think, that the signs, the sort of weak in many respects, fledging little signs of this happening are much more um, obvious than they were when I wrote the book. In fact, in the last chapter of the book, I have a, I have a section headed Intimations of a Challenge, a challenge to the reigning orthodoxy. And I mention Compass, I mention the Green Movement, uh, I mention all you know, good causes like this, and you may say, well, this is a load of rubbish, this is, these are all feeble and weak, and they're not going to get anywhere, and they're not getting anywhere now, and they won't get anywhere in the future. But I think, I think that's being, uh, I now feel more optimistic about the chances of their getting somewhere than I did when I sent this book in to the publishers in, after all, May, May 2013, so it's quite a long time ago. Um, why do I feel a bit more optimistic? Well, partly, I suppose, actually I am by nature an optimist. <laughs> I, mean, I can't help it, you know. Um, I wouldn't have been attracted to be head of the smallest and poorest college in Oxford if I hadn't been an optimist. Um, and I wouldn't have set up the centre in Sheffield if I hadn't been an optimist either. But it's not just that. I really do sense, uh, you know, there's a tide in the affairs of men or whatever it is. And I think the tide is beginning to turn just ever so slightly. I think the whole issue of equality and inequality has become far more salient, is more salient now than it was in the first six months of 2013 when I was, when I was finishing, you know, the edited version going through the editor's corrections in my manuscript. Um, I think the whole issue of the Green Movement has changed, has become more salient too. I think the increasing strength of the Green Party is very indicative, really very indicative of something. Um, I think uh, the interventions in debate of my old friend David Owen have been remarkable. Um, in pushing the issue of the future of the NHS and the need to save, to save the NHS from destruction. And I think there is also a sign. Now, I may be kidding myself, of course, I know that. But look, we are now facing a government committed to an absolute, well, the Institute for Fiscal Studies calls it a radical reimagining of the state. I would put it, put it more strongly than that. It's not just a reimagining of the state. It is a slimming down of the state to a level 
that existed, hasn't existed since the 1930s. This is incredible. And it's not just the state, it's not just the public sector, it's also the public realm in the wider mm. sense. So I, I think people are beginning to see that the alternative being, the, the future scenario being sketched out by this government is actually intolerable. Now, the Labour Party has got, you know, it's got a lot of ground to make up, it's got a lot of um, old scores to forget, actually, if it possibly can, and not everybody in the Labour Party wants it to forget them. Um, there is still Peter Mandelson stalking around. <laughs> but, but I think, I, I, I th really think that, I mean, Ed Balls, for God's sake, you know, Ed Balls was up to his neck in the uh, absurd and grotesque adulation of the city in the days when Gordon Brown was Chancellor of the Exchequer. I mean, Ed Balls was his, sort of, his right-hand man from way back. Ed Balls now sounds to me that he really believes it when he said we cannot go back to a 1930s society. And that's the issue. So I, I, I think there is a rallying. Um, I wish that the um, I wish that the Labour Party was more not more brave, it is being quite brave, but not more coherent. It still doesn't give, to me anyway, uh, a, a, a kind of a vision of the future which is positive rather than negative. Okay. I mean, it says, it says we don't want to go back to Britain of the 1930s. Hooray! A good start. <laughs> but where do you want to go to instead? And on that, it's not so clear. But on the other hand, you know, Maybe, and th this in a sense I think is some of the, picks up some of the things that Colin Crouch was saying in, in a rather different way. Maybe you can't any longer. I mean, we, we, we're not living in 1945. We're not living even in 1964-6 when it was possible. So maybe we are where we are. But I, I think I, I have hope, hope in the short term um, rather than rather than fear and I think as well the Scottish referendum now can we somehow manage can the Labour Party can people in in England south of the border and in Wales somehow manage to generate and feed on and develop that sense of possibility that there was in the Scottish referendum. Um, and can hope become stronger than fear? I think there are signs, but I wouldn't go further than that. But I'm optimistic enough to think if, if the omens are good. If, if, someone, asked, if, if someone asked you to, um, to describe yourself now, to put a label on yourself, I am a, what would it, what would it be, what are you? <laughs> oh God, I'm uh, an elderly gent, <laughs> walking with the age of a stick, uh, um, suffering from innumerable, costing the National Health Service vast sums of money, which, they, which I pour down my gullet in order to stay alive. That's you know, not... You, you know what I'm after. You are... You, 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 you don't really mean that, do you? No, what I do mean... I, 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 uh, <laughs> At least I hope you don't. I'll tell you what I mean. You're, you're, I mean. One of your interests is that you are... You are both, on the one hand, it seems to me, extraordinarily consistent. The sort of the core of what you're saying, if you, you know... It's, someone who's read you from the, you know, from the 70s onwards. I mean, you're at the core of your, your message as a public moralist is pretty damn consistent. And yet, it's also extraordinarily eclectic and pulls in stuff from all over the place. Uh, you know, and you want to put Burke in bed with Tawny and you want to do all kinds of things. And given the time now, and I, I'm listening to you now, I suspect you know you're now adding on a bit of greenery, and you'll you're, and you'll you'll probably join Plaid Cymru shortly. Uh, <laughs> I just I just I just I just wonder where you think you're at now. Well, I think at a very deep level, I'm at where I've always been, 
I'm a liberal social democrat um, believing in um, a richer and more participative form of democracy. Uh, as I said, I think somewhere upstairs, one of the heroes I have, which is mentioned in the book and as nobody seems to have picked up, is Amartya Sen. And Amartya Sen's notion of democracy as public reasoning seems to me profound and absolutely necessary to make a reality of. And public reasoning, as I understand it from Amartya's point of view, I mean, what he says is, look, you can have democratic institutions, and these matter, of course they do, free elections, uh, blah, 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 free press, and so on and so on. But that's not all it is. In addition, there have got to be spaces within society where people can come together and reason publicly. And the important point is public. Now, that seems to me to be a very profound thought. I haven't worked it through, I have to admit, myself, not yet. But that's perhaps the next thing I should try to do. And I, I mean, I'm a huge fan of, of a marches. I think the, the idea of making a reality of that, and in any changes that there are, in the constitution of the country and so on and so forth, that must be a central theme, I think. And, and, and actually, um, Jean's fascinating talk about the BBC made, made me think about that. In a way, that is where public reasoning does take place on a remarkable, remarkable scale. Um, sometimes it's pretty unedifying, you know, but then public activities often are unedifying. But you know, day by day, the Today program and uh, the World at One and all these things that happen, there's a astounding degree of public reasoning going on there. Um, so, sorry, I'm losing my thread. No, let me put it differently. Um, like you, I, I've often used the, I've, I've used Henry Dove oh, yes. a lot. Tawny's yeah. Henry Dove, yeah. who stands for, what, what does he stand for? Describe him somewhere as sort of pragmatic, unimaginative, ordinary, solid, solid Englishman. English, yeah, Englishman. English working, working, working man. I should, I should say. I mean, who is Henry Dove today? Gosh. Gosh. That is a very difficult question, isn't it? I wonder what Tawny would say. Um, I interviewed Tawny, you know, for his 80th birthday. Um, and wrote a piece in the Guardian. I went, was sent there by the Guardian to, in, to interview him. And um, <laughs> this, isn't actually a, this isn't actually evading the point, at least I don't think it is. Um, he, he told me two things that have stuck in my mind ever since. One, he said, that he learnt more from his adult education classes uh, in the north of England um, than they learnt from him. But he also said, it, apropos of that, it's rather interesting, he said, you know, those were self-respecting working men, not like the sort of people that you find in London. Right? Um, the other thing that I found very moving about in Tawny's writings is, you know, he was wounded on the first day of the Somme. He, he, he refused a commission and rose to be a sergeant. Uh, and he was wounded seriously on the first day of the Somme. And uh, he was sort of rescued by a bricklayer. And he says somewhere that, you know, if, if I could choose the person I would most like to have with me at a pinch, it would be that bricklayer. And that's Henry Dove. Yeah, but my, now, see, my, my question so you think is, is, my it, question is isn't, 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 the Hen, isn't, isn't, who is this Henry Dove now, well, maybe on whom all these hopes are pinned? Isn't Henry Dove Emily Thornberry's white man with a van and a flag? I don't think so. Um, I don't think Tawny would have thought so either. But on the other hand, you must, uh, since we're talking about Tawny and about Henry Dove, Henry Dove was an Englishman, all right? Yeah. Uh, and Tawny was an Englishman too, all right? 
Um, there's a wonderful piece in a collection of um, essays about Gate School, um, in an article in it, and I can't remember, edited by Bill Rogers mm. after mm. Gate School mm. died. I can't remember the name of the author. I think it was Poston, the mm. economic historian yeah. Poston, mm. uh, who was a friend of Gate School's. And um, Poston says that uh, they went often to see Tawney. Tawney was one of their inspirations. Uh, and Tawney talked about he found it intolerable that his fellow Englishmen <laughs> should be in the conditions that they were. And Poston said to Gateskill afterwards, wh why only fellow Englishmen? Why not fellow human beings? And Gateskill said, well, I, I would say fellow Englishmen as well. So there was this deep Englishness about Tawney, hmm. which, um, which I think is very fundamental. Now, huh, are there Henry Dubbs? I don't see why isn't the man, actually, who uh, this lady photographed. He might be. I mean, because one of the things which we talked a lot about um, upstairs, about the um, Scots and the Welsh, well, particularly about the Scots, I managed to get in a little bit about the Welsh, but nobody talked much about the English. It, it sort of came in, but not much. And um, I think this is now the great question. Is there a Henry Dub in England? Or maybe there are several Henry Dubs in England and what's wrong with the guy that, um, what's her name? Thornbury. Thornbury, yeah, what, what's wrong with him, actually? Okay, sure, he's an English patriot. What's wrong with being an English patriot? Doesn't all have to be UKIP. Yeah. He might be, but yeah. he, might, he might not be. You shouldn't assume that just because he's got an English no. flag, he's there for a social fascist Can we just beast. have a word about England? Though? Yeah. Because I mean, John McIntosh, who we've mentioned many times. John McIntosh, who we've mentioned many times, wasn't just interested in Scotland. No. Of course, I mean, I mean he was the great exponent of a form of English regionalism. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Now, as someone, maybe Donald or someone pointed out, people in England seem profoundly uninterested in any of that. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Well, for my sins, I was... Um, they must be fairly severe sins. Um, I was uh, inveigled by, um, I forget the guy's name now, um, MP for one of the Sheffield constituencies whom I got to know when I was working in Sheffield, who was really a kind of stooge for John Prescott, right? Prescott wanted regional government in England. Cable. That's right, yeah, that's right, Cable, yeah. He was a lovely guy. The word was. stooge was the trigger, was it? Yeah. No, I, I was the stooge. I was the stooge. <laughs> Cable was the, was the go-between. Um, anyway, the idea was to set up something called, a, I think it was going to be called the Regional Studies Association, or something <laughs> like that. And I was going to set up. Anyway, I got, I got quite interested in all this stuff. Uh, and I believed passionately in the idea of regional government. Um, I thought, as did Prescott, obviously, and Caborn, the best place to start was the northern region. Uh, it had the strongest regional identity, uh, which he felt very, you know, very proud of. Um, and then look what happened. Now, I, th I still am torn. This goes back to some of the discussions we were having upstairs about the state, the British state. Um, because, of course, what was offered to the public of the northern region was a nonsense. Mm. It was just so pathetically trivial. There were no serious powers being, being devolved to this uh, autonomous northern region. Um, and the argument that it was just jobs for the boys, just another layer of politicians, was very, very difficult to counter. <sighs> Why? Well, Judith's question in one of the one of the sessions upstairs, what are you going to do about the Treasury, comes hugely clattering along. The Treasury would hate, absolutely hate, anything like that. Um, and uh, I think within the Cabinet, I don't know exactly how it all worked out, of course, because, you know, we don't know. We'll know one day, but we don't know yet. But it's pretty clear to me 
but the proposals that poor old Prescott actually wanted were watered down to such a point that it was not surprising that nobody voted, only a trivial number of people voted for them. Now, what would have happened if it had been a sensible, you know, mm. serious devolution to a regional tier? We obviously, by definition, can't know. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't exclude it. I don't see why we should exclude the possibility. Can I try something else? There was yeah. a lady. Okay. That's yeah, very good. I, you know, I should have said that. Well, I wasn't fully aware of it, but yeah, definitely. Let me try just another tack if I can. Oh, your first book was Ramsay MacDonald. This may be an unfair question, but I've tried anyway. If Ramsay MacDonald was to read Mammon's Kingdom, <laughs> <laughs> what, would he, what would he say about it, do you think? Very interesting. Of course, he would be, if Ramsay MacDonald, as he was at the time, was to be reborn now, you were saying, really, it has to be that, doesn't it? Or does no, it mean the no, Ramsay MacDonald no. as he actually was, I, I, or I, sort I, of I, fictional Ramsay MacDonald? I, well, let's take him as he was. Let's take him as he was. I think he would have thought it was too pessimistic. Um, <coughs> I think he, he, was a, he insisted all through, right to his dying day, that he was a socialist. He, um, was a gradualist, of course. Um, he managed to, in a way, he was a, he was a charismatic populist, a bit like, um, I don't know, Boris Johnson, except with a, with a different accent. Um, but he did, I think, articulate, and <coughs> in doing so, give sort of form and content to the aspirations of the labor movement. Um, there's a wonderful uh, essay on him by a German socialist, Egon Wertheimer, <coughs> who was the London correspondent of Vorwärts, if that's how you pronounce it, the German Social Democrat official paper, in which he says, that describes Ramsay MacDonald, has a lovely phrase, as the focus of the mute hopes of a class. And I think that's what he was in the 20s. Um, well, he didn't do very well in government. Mind you, did better than people think, but... Well, that's the bit I'm after, because, uh, you see, I think... Uh, well, I mean, he, he was... He, he, I mean, he was a great rhetorician. He, he, uh, he, uh, he, since he knew which way history was going, um, and it was all going in the right direction, until it, you were confronted with an economic crisis, and then hadn't got a clue what to do. Of course, this was an example of Collins stuff, really. This was um, globalization. And we, I mean, we tend to think that globalization is something that only happens now. In fact, of course, in many crucial ways, the, uh, there was an, a global economy then too. Uh, and by the way, the city of London was a very central part of this global economy uh, then as now. So um, the crisis was global. He was right in saying that. Yeah. And w I mean, the poor guy, you know, he's struggling around saying, so my friends, it's not we who are on trial, it's capitalism who yeah. is on trial. Uh, but, but, as but as long as you stayed at that level, he was fine. This is Michael Jacobs' point, I think, from earlier on, which is that, in a sense, social democracy uh, is a kind of dependent strategy. I mean, it, it lives off the back of capitalism. As long as capitalism does well, yeah. it, will, it will do well. Where it get, runs into trouble is when capitalism runs badly, and that's why now, it's, it's usual to say, well, actually, we've, and Michael, I think, was, was saying this, actually, we've got to go and actually revisit capital itself mm. Uh, mm. rather than just live in that <coughs> sort of derivative status, mm. of which mm. MacDonald was a classic yeah. example. As long as you stayed at the level of generality, he was fine. 
soaring. Once you hit reality, he was stuck. Well, that's not quite fair, because he was, in fact, very successful indeed as Foreign Secretary mm. in the 1924 government, and also, I think, in certain aspects of the 1929-31 uh, government. But that's, okay, that was a sort of, in a way, a side issue. <coughs> but I think the, yeah, and maybe, maybe that is the case. So, <laughs> we come back to Marx, don't we? <laughs> the best analysis that, well, maybe not the best, maybe not the right, not fully correct, but in a way, the most, one, of the, one of the most serious analysts of capitalism that there's ever been, okay? Um, and this is why I think the Piketty book, Capital in the 21st Century, is perhaps another um, swallow, faint swallow, it becomes a faint swallow, um, indicating the, a spring which is coming. Because I do think this, the trouble is, of course, that articulating that in an everyday, in a political climate dominated by the present paradigm, intellectual, cultural, and so on, is bloody difficult. Mm. May not be possible. I mean, what would happen if um, Ed Ball said, well, look, Chaps, I've been reading Piketty. I'm very impressed by this. I think he's right. And I think we need uh, massive wealth taxes. Not in bugging about with these sort of mansion taxes. That's just a peanuts. What we need is serious wealth taxes. And by the way, across the globe. And that's what my policy is going to be. <laughs> what would happen? But that's the measure of the distance we've travelled from a kind of Crosland position, isn't it? Where you just assume that capitalism, the problem of ownership is solved, yeah. capitalism delivers, you just decide how to, how to distribute the proceeds through taxation, all very sweet. Um, yeah. And we know that doesn't, we, we've, we've, that doesn't, that's not where we're at. And so the reason why people now talk about supply-side socialism is because they need to go to the other end and start looking at actually the structure of capitalism itself. Yeah, it's not so easy to do, is it? I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying it, you sh that isn't where we should be, what we should be trying to do, I'm sure that's right. But it's not so easy to see how you do it in practice, in detail. Um, <clears throat> you need, I suppose, to have a much better understanding of the levers that there are for you to use. And the trouble is, in 30 years, the, um, one of the things that's happened since Thatcher is the stripping down, not just the stripping down of the state, but really the stripping down of the civil service. And I think it was, I forget, I think it was um, uh, Gene Seaton who said something about me being rather pro the civil service, grand civil service. Well, yes, actually this was. And the 1945 Labour government wouldn't have been able to do what it did if it hadn't had mm. that structure, which of course it inherited from the war. But as a matter of fact, um, even the 64-70 Labour government was not as bad as it's sometimes thought. It did quite a lot of good things. It also made this absurd hoo-ha about in place of strike, which was not, in fact, pushed onto it by the civil service at all. That was Barbara Castle. But the, mm. the um, point is that um, with the civil service stripped down to the extent it now is, almost broken-backed, I'm not sure you could. You'd have to reinvent the civil service. because. And this has all been part, and this is, this is one of the things I tr do try to say in this book, which I find the mo one of the most depressing things, actually, about the current scene in this country, is the steady denigration that has gone on since, actually, um, since the Thatcher era, not just of the civil service, but of professions yeah, and professionalism ask, I want to ask you about as such. Yeah. And that, <coughs> that has gone on and on and on and on, um, so that... Um, who was it was saying upstairs that they'd learnt a lot from Harold Perkin? Um, somebody did. Perhaps it was you. No, um, no it wasn't. Well, anyway, H Harold on... Oh, that's right, it was you. Yeah, Harold on the uh, rise of professional society and all that. This was great. And, um, well, he thinks that uh, the crisis of professionalism is partly due to the fact that there was a... Uh, the professionals got to be too hubristic. 
There may be something in that, but I don't think that's the whole story at all. There's also a deliberate and sustained attack on the whole notion of professionalism. But can I... Except for professionals, except for one profession, city traders. Yeah. See, can I... This is the one area... This is, this is the one area where I... I, I over the years, I have wanted to have a mild disagreement with you. Um, uh, you see, I... Let me put it as briefly as I, as I, as I can. I, I, I thought, part, partly because you, it, rightly you, you, you stress the importance of professional traditions and professional services and so on, that you, and I thought this very much after I read your book, The Decline of the Public, when I was in full public mm. service reform mode, mm. Mm. and I, I just thought that as well as being serious about the market, you had to be serious about the state as well. Mm. And mm. that just not in a rather general way <coughs> and, and, and think about territorial politics, but actually a, 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 a party of the left had to be serious about thinking about the organization of state services in a way that <gasps> took on board arguments about the dangers of monopoly, uh, sought to open, up, open them up in a variety of ways. Now, I know a lot of that all went wrong, but, but I, you see, I, I think simply to, def, to defend, you know, keep off, this is professional territory. If people had said, if Nye Bevan had said that about the medical profession, we never would have had a health service. I mean, it, I, so I think I was, I was I, you, you tended to, to be very protective about areas of professionalism. And as you know, in practice, professionalism is, is, is Janus faced. One side of it is all to do with maintenance of standards, all the rest of it. The other side is uh, professional self-interest. And if you're serious about the state, it seems to me, and not least because you have to make, you have to make public services popular to people who use them. And that means thinking quite creatively about how they're organized. Yeah, sure. Well, I don't, I don't disagree with that at all. I think, the, I think there's a big difference, though, between imposing um, bogus forms of uh, accountability. Mm. And, if, and as Nora O'Neill, in that brilliant book, A Question of Trust, puts it, um, perverse incentives. Yeah, all that is true. And, and that's, you've got to somehow steer a very, very difficult course between just say, well, boys, you, you're the professionals, you, you yeah. run the show. But, I, like. but I, I think what I'm saying is I don't think, that, I don't think people who are broadly on the left or progressives just gave enough attention to thinking of different models of how you might run mm. state services. Um, we were very good at s stopping things happening to them, but actually offering a different model, rather like we're now talking about different approach to uh, company law, ownership, and all those kind of things. I mean, it, it, there, there, is yeah. a, there is a universe of options here, and we were, we were on the state side, I thought we were extraordinarily uncreative, and it wasn't just enough to defend things as they were. When you're saying, who's the we that you're talking about? Well, in what context did I say we then? Well, you said we were. Well, I'm, we I, 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 I'm the great progressive assembly of us people here. Well, yeah, but I mean, we weren't uh, actually in power, most of us here. No, we were. No, we, no, yeah, but honestly, look, seriously. We were uh, part of a universe of thought at the time. Yes, but um, we had um, all this jumping up and down um, by Tony Blair. Um, interesting how the uh, Iraq war was viewed by professionals, right? professional diplomats and indeed professional soldiers, as mm. far as one can tell. <coughs> but the, um, sorry, I'm losing my thread. The, the, I don't think that the Labour government, after all, you were in Parliament, um, and you were running this, you're doing a magnificent job running your, your, your select committee, which was huge, a huge step forward in all kinds of ways, not least in increasing the capacity of the uh, legislature to scrutinize the executive, and, and I really take my hat off to you for all that you did in that, in that role. But it, what, there was a Labour government, a new Labour government in power, and it didn't really do anything about this. Now, okay, we in this room, we're not telling them, you must do this, I accept that, perhaps we should have done. 
But they didn't have to have us say that, for God's sake. Why didn't they do it themselves? Instead, instead, what you clearly had was in the sphere of uh, health care, you had what Colin Lees calls the plot against the NHS. And if you read David Owen's book, The Nation's Health, it's absolutely clear that there was a long sustained period lasting from about the year 2000 uh, until the fall of the Brown government uh, where, where the um, thrust was all the time towards, first of all, marketizing the health service and then privatizing it. And successive, successive new labor secretaries for health were not just allowing this to happen, they were eagerly pressing it forward. I can see there's one or two people who want to come in. I, I've hogged all this. Let's be, can you be short and sharp? Michael, you wanted to. Uh, just, just on that very point, of course, one of the, one of the few people who did, some, who did some serious thinking about <coughs> how you run public services, which actually does belong in our, literally in our, in our assembly, even though he's not here, is Julian McGrath, who is a member of the, of the Episcopal Court of the UK, as you all recall, and who did try and theorize from a market socialist That's fascinating and deeply depressing. And I mean, I was a great admirer of Gordon Brown's in many ways, um, but it's, I'm afraid it's the tragedy of Gordon Brown on issue after issue after issue. Um, that he was all on the right side, believed in constitutional reform you know, and all this, but somehow it just, he just didn't, couldn't bring himself to do it, could he? And he was a great man. I mean, I really do admire him, but there you are. We have, fi we, we have five minutes, then we can get a drink. So if you could be pretty sharp with the questions, George. There's a progressive dilemma that social democrats face, which really hasn't come up today, but it's highly relevant for discussions about the English question. Uh, the, the colleague to my right raised the question of devolving to city regions mm. Uh, some and, and a mention of directly elected mayors for these bodies. But isn't the dilemma for social democrats that on the one hand there's a Fabian centralizing tradition that you've got to think of the whole country and have uniform standards, etc. But on the other hand, there's also a social democratic uh, tradition that believes in local government in people yeah. locally governing yeah. themselves and taking decisions about how they shape their community. That seems to me to be a very relevant uh, dilemma for social democrats in the coming weeks. Yeah, should we take that as a comment? Or? Well, yes, I think this is absolutely right. Of course, oddly enough, the Fabians were not centralists to start with. I mean. If you go back to the period before 1914, um, Webb was a very active member of the London County Council uh, and chaired, I forget what committee it was, technical education or something like that. Um, uh, Bernard Shaw was a vestryman in St Pancras Borough Council and worked hard uh, at the local level. And if you read some of Sidney Webb's writings in the proving that socialism was coming inexorably. Uh, how does he prove this? I forget what the book is called now, but it was published, I think, before 1914, and, and the examples he gives are all of local government. 
gas and yeah. water socialism. And this was the great, it wasn't just Fabians either, of course, uh, Joseph Chamberlain as Lord Mayor of Birmingham was a, in a way a gas and water socialist. Um, and he didn't even mind using the word socialist either. So there is, has been that tradition. I think really what happened is, is that the Fabian, Fabian centralism was born really after it looked as if the central state was able to be won by Labour. Before then, before 1914, it looked as if the Liberals were going to remain the sort of hegemonic party of the left. Um, and um, you could achieve, in effect, a, a kind of socialism working at the local level. That tradition, I, don't, I think it's, now I don't know enough about what's going on now, but it sounds to me from what various people are saying that it's still, it still is, a, is around and could be a revived. But it does, need, it does need some kind of a, a long time ago, I remember being involved, it was a funny thing that the SRC was trying to run about citizenship. And there was a Scottish law professor called Carty who was involved in this. The initiative got nowhere, um, like many of the initiatives I've been involved in in my, in my life. But, but it was going to be, um, there was a Scottish law professor called Carty, and I remember him saying, the trouble is the silent English. We can't have a proper debate about these sorts of things so long as the English are silent. Uh, that, that's very powerful, I think. And that's been the story. So, you know, maybe that's what we should do. We should go out and meet this, meet, meet this nice lady with her, uh, or no, the nice guy, wasn't he, with the white van and all that, and try and get him involved. Okay, I'm going to take just a couple more and then we finish. Um, is it Anthony? Sorry. No, Hi, no. yeah. Uh, um, I, I want to just uh, ask you, David, to sort of challenge the, your allegiance, as we're uh, after this very interesting day, to uh, social democracy. You described yourself at the beginning as a sort of liberal social democrat, and here you are advocating the Greens and joining Plaid. And uh, there's, so there's something going on there, and I've never thought of you as a kind of Labour tribalist. Mm -hmm. uh, the Labour tribalist so the way I would want to put the question is, I don't think anyone's talked about your the very admirable history of British democracy since 1918. And in that, you name uh, four traditions which you say w were mixed up in the different parties. Yeah, yeah. So they weren't like, they, they were, what was fascinating was they were like things which pe positions, political traditions which people held simultaneously and I think there were it was English nationalism which is so to speak Tory nationalism Tory, I it. Tory, Tory nationalism Whig uh, imperialism, Whig, Whig imperialism uh, Labour centralism Democratic collectivist Democratic collectivist Dem Democratic and collectivist. that was because uh, Sidney Webb called De himself that. Democratic collectivist and, and, and Republican Democratic Republican Democratic Republicanism Republican. exactly Republican. and the Democratic Northern. Republican tradition, which I think you would kindly suggest in Charter 88, or proudly was part of, the nearest from reading the book that they got to power was when Milton was the secretary to Cromwell's cabinet. <laughs> so far, <laughs> we're very patient. <laughs> but it seems to me that what's now happening, Scotland is an example of this, is that the, the forces of change which are taking place are no longer falling inside those four and that that there's a way in which uh, you really belong to that fourth tradition rather than to putting yourself in that of, uh, of democratic centralism. Oh, certainly, absolutely, yes. Yeah. I mean, one, I keep on mentioning people that I owe intellectual debts to. One of the ones whom I owe a huge intellectual debt to is Quentin Skinner and his notion of Roman liberty Liberty is freedom from domination. Uh, and I find that, that's what I mean by republicanism. So I, I, yeah, if I had to choose one word, I think it would be republican. I mean, the trouble is if you say you're a republican, then you get mixed up with all sorts of rubbish about <laughs> the queen and so yeah. on, and I'm not into that. I mean, I think it would be much better to get rid of her, but I, I, you know, I'm, I, I sort of like a big deal as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But repu the republican view of the human self and the relationship of people to power seems to is one that I identify with enormously. 
So yes, long live Machiavelli. <laughs> it's going to be really quick. Yes, um, in terms of looking for positives about progressives, yeah. um, you and others this afternoon have mentioned the energising impact of the Scottish referendum campaign. You and others have talked about the Greens. No one, to my knowledge, has mentioned the new wave of feminism. I just wondered if you had any comments on that. Well, I think they. I think feminism. I, I'm not. Well, I'm not quite sure what is meant by the new wave of feminism. Um, yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> which is the old wave, and which is the new wave, and so on. Um, but um, yeah, it's a nice lady in the front here is saying it's dialectical. I love things to be dialectical. <laughs> it means that you don't have to make <laughs> difficult choices. But uh, look, I think the the woman's movement, if you want to call it that, going back actually, after all, to the suffragettes at least, actually to Florence Nightingale, you could argue, um, has changed our society more during my lifetime than any other single thing, actually. Completely transformed it in a whole host of ways. Uh, now, admittedly, I say that as somebody who doesn't like doing the washing up. But uh, no, obviously that's true. Um, what? <laughs> that's not. Yes, that's but the not, trouble is, I'm married not. to an. I'm married to a not, very good cook. Let us not go anywhere near any of that sort of stuff. <laughs> can I just now, ask? I tell you something. I, Colin Crouch is one of the best cooks I've ever okay, met in my okay, life. Okay. As we end, can I just ask David? I mean, you, you, I can see you've clearly got some intellectual heroes. Have you had any kind of political hero? Politician hero? Yeah. Um, Bevan. Bevan? Yeah, Nye Bevan. When I was young, I was absolutely entranced by Nye. Um, he came to Oxford to speak, not at the Union, but in the Union Hall in my first term, and I can still hear his voice. And he, when he talked about, uh, I forget what it was, 500,000, this was attacking German rearmament, German foot soldiers are going to make a difference. How nonsensical. And then, and then, I heard him speak at Trafalgar Square on Suez. i never forget that. That was, actually, that was, uh, I suppose, for my particular generation, the radicalizing influence, um, out of which the new left actually came, I think. Um, we all went back to Oxford, Oxford again, I remember, going with, going with various good souls like Stuart Hall, I remember it was one of them, uh, and uh, we were talking about how to bring marbles to the next demonstration so that you could stop the, the mounted police <laughs> from doing anything, and um, discussing very seriously uh, what would the possibilities, and as we thought, probabilities, of a general strike by the mass ranks of the TUC against the Suez invasion, which 90% of their members, at least, were in favor of. <laughs> What's interesting is that you are such a generous and Catholic um, thinker that I, I, I had to make sure you said Bevan, because it's quite likely that you would have said Bevin, because you speak with enormous warmth about Bevin I as do, well. Yeah. And that, is, and that again, is very reflective, I think, yeah. of of your approach to these things. Look, we're going to end. Um, I tried to pick a fight with you, and uh, not very sp wholeheartedly, really. You were very um, nice. Much too nice. The only real complaint I have is that you have an excessive use of the word mordant, uh, which, which, which I've, just, I've, just been, I've just been re I've just been rereading all your great works. You love the word, and now I find I'm starting to use it, uh, <laughs> which is why I've just mentioned it. Right. Uh, but I think, just to, let me just say this to him with, um, <laughs> yeah. I think David earlier on said, you know, this is a moment of extraordinary interest. Now, I tend, you know, we tend to say that sort of thing when, just to cheer ourselves up. But in fact, it is a moment of extraordinary interest. I mean, I, can't, I cannot remember um, a moment of such fluidity 
in the political landscape as now. There is a real sense in which, in which politics in this country, and indeed more widely, has become unfrozen. Mm. Uh, mm. And that opens up possibilities that I think we're only just beginning to imagine. Uh, and I'm afraid th th this requires more work from you because um, uh, this is not just a retrospect today. Uh, I think it's opened up prospects, too, that require further Malkandian treatment. So, um, Albeit modern ones. We, <laughs> we look forward, uh, and not just backwards, uh, but for the moment, we say thank you very much, David. Well, thank you so much for having us. Oh, you are lovely. Well... Well, I know, it, I really owe all this to Jean, I know.